he wrote this book and he had all kinds of examples of, of violence and uh, phallic symbols. It really made a statement and it drew a line in the sand that comics, again, aren't just for children. So there were these two Jewish guys arguing about whether it would be offensive to Christians to say that Christ was more powerful than a vampire. Good always triumphs, and evil was always punished. There was never anything sexual, violent, or unpatriotic in early comic books. Why? Well, first off, they were published just for kids. And second, there was a rating system that made sure there was nothing in a comic book that would corrupt an innocent young reader. There's a lot of mystery around exactly how the comics code happened and exactly how EC took one in the neck for it. In the early 50s, a uh, psychologist named Dr. Frederick Wortham published a book called Seduction of the Innocent, which was essentially about how comics were corrupting the youth of America. And he, he wrote this book and he had all kinds of examples of, of violence and uh, phallic symbols that were hidden in the artwork. And I mean, the whole thing was kind of strange. It was a kind of an extension of McCarthyism into the juvenile delinquency problem and into uh, blaming a scapegoat like the comics. Look, the, the comics code was this amazing boondoggle that the comics publishers of the 1950s came up with to sort of convince the American public that all comics weren't evil and all comics weren't out there to warp your children's minds. That they, uh, the, the major comic book publishers got together and created a, the Comics Code Authority, put a big giant stamp on the face of every comic and was your signal to parents across the world that this comic had been approved by, you know, by this board of white-haired old ladies who wouldn't let anything evil or destructive enter your comic. And, and, and boy, they were white-haired old ladies, and boy, did they go through and boundarize that material. You couldn't have the word terror, or weird, or horror, or crime in the titles. And that immediately eliminated our entire line of comics, because <laughs> that's what we had. So it was uh, uh, kind of a, a mutual thing that they got rid of us, uh, the, the, our fellow publishers, and at the same time tried to pacify the public's uh, arousal uh, of the problem of juvenile delinquency. And of course, you know that when we dropped our comics and uh, horror and science and crime comics were eliminated, juvenile delinquency in America went away. There was a point in the story of Tomb of Dracula that lasted a couple years that Dracula took over a deconsecrated church and there was a painting of Christ on the wall. And virtually every line of dialogue I wrote where Dracula is actually saying he's powerless against Christ, the Comics Code would object to. And I'm Jewish, first of all, and the head of the Comics Code was Jewish, so there were these two Jewish guys arguing about whether it would be offensive to Christians to say that Christ was more powerful than a vampire. By the time of the 80s and early 90s, the comics code was just a joke. 85%, 90% of the comics we were publishing were sold strictly through comic book stores who couldn't care less whether there was a comics code stamp on it or whatever, and they were only selling to 19-year-olds in college anyway. So. Finally, and to his credit, Joe Quesada, the, the, the executive editor at Marvel, uh, took a stand a few years ago and just said, screw it, we're just gonna drop the comics code. Nobody cares, they're more concerned with Janet Jackson showing her boob on national television than, than they are with anything we're doing in the comics. And the comics code is just, uh, it's, it, it's this ghost of whatever it was supposed to be in the beginning. Uh, let it go. In the 1980s, two major works changed not only our concept of heroism, but also the idea that comic books were just for kids. There are Alan Moore and Dave Gibbons' Watchmen and Frank Miller's Dark Knight Returns. 
the books that are the class of 1986, Watchmen, Dark Knight, all of them very much changed the way we look at heroes in general. I mean, Frank Miller was the first guy to give us a Batman with a much earthier, much more vital, much more almost vicious character that was about as far away from Adam West and Bam Pal Zap as you can get. By that time, I mean, basically, superhero comics had, were kind of running out of steam a bit. I mean, we were looking at things like, you know, Dazzler is not exactly a major step forward in the art form here. And it was about time for something to go forward. And many people would have thought perhaps that the thing was played out. And it's, it's a, a, a testament to Miller and Moore and Gibbons that they were able to take what seemed like a moribund art form, a moribund genre, I should say, um, and eject, just cut through and find levels of humanity and depth and politics uh, that had never been tapped into before. In Dark Knight Returns, Batman is really portrayed as somebody who has crossed the line into uh, inhabiting a character that is a little bit sadistic and fascistic. He's willing to do anything to put down crime, and that could be beating the heads of criminals, but it also might mean you know, beating the heads of law-abiding citizens. What Alan Moore and Dave Gibbons were doing with Watchmen was, again, a pointedly very sophisticated, very adult look at what superheroes would be like if they really existed in the world. Watchmen is Alan Moore's attempt to answer a very simple question. What if superheroes were real? And you have this, this genre that exists in a fantasy setting where the laws of time and nature and physics don't apply by any stretch. Uh, and instead of bringing them down to reality, he brings reality to the superheroes to see how you could possibly get Batman to be Batman, how you could possibly get Superman to the point where he could be Superman, uh, and what would the consequences be? And the questions Moore asks, okay, well, what would make Batman dress up in tights and fight crime? And the only possible answer that Moore can come up with, which is symbolized through Night Owl, uh, is you'd have to have a serious sexual fetish. You would have to be impotent without the costume, and it's all about sex, and that, that works perfectly with Batman psychology. Superheroes are nothing but really male wish fulfillment stuff. You know, I, want, I, want, I wish I had big muscles. I wish nobody could push me around. Uh, that's why they've always appealed to little boys. But Watchmen was a chance to sort of see how they might appeal to adults. And boy, it took off. It really made a statement and it drew a line in the sand that comics, again, aren't just for children. The blood-stained smiley face button is a recurring visual image in Alan Moore's Watchmen. Though most notably worn as a decoration by the comedian, it resurfaces through the book in various forms. Watchmen and Dark Knight Returns changed the industry overnight. Suddenly, comics were being written and drawn for an older and more mature audience. Miller was upset with what happened after uh, his graphic novel and Moore's graphic novel because he thinks a lot of comics artists thought that what made Watchmen and Dark Knight brilliant was the violence, as opposed to, let's say, the political awareness that Moore and Miller demonstrated. I think that frequently what happens when something like Watchmen or Dark Knight comes along is that they're so financially successful that the imitators ruin them for everybody. Uh, taken by themselves, those books did not plunge the industry into a, a period of darkness, but unfortunately there were a lot of people who all they, they learned from those was the, the, the marketplace wants dark. Well, the, the backlash came pretty quickly, unfortunately. The, the problem is that, you know, nothing breeds imitation like success. And with Watchmen and Dark Knight, a lot of writers and artists who followed in, in the footsteps of those guys, you know, all they looked at was the surface elements of those books, which is the darkness. You're supposed to write what you know, and we're talking about comics writers whose biggest problem is the cable guy's not going to show up on Tuesday, and that's, that's their idea of grim and gritty. So they're trying to explain to me what life is like in the seedy underbelly of the city, and I, I'm not buying it. And unfortunately, as Alan saw it, basically, is that he didn't, his message in Watchmen wasn't, you know, copy this, let's have a lot more nasty characters breaking fingers. Um, that's just, it was actually, the message should have been, rethink superheroes, there's more ways of doing them. But inevitably what happens if someone succeeds and somebody opens up a particular new path, people come charging down that same path and do the same thing. So we had, you know, within a short time, lots of really mediocre, nasty superheroes. My theory is that comics had languished so long 
in being a children's medium, that when the time came for us, the chance came for us to accelerate into an adult medium, we overcompensated like hell. And we over accelerated the maturation to the point where suddenly all we were doing was stuff that was targeted toward adults and even then sort of arrested adolescent adults. Superhero comic books had entered a very dark and gritty place where the difference between heroes and villains was almost non-existent. But out of that darkness came a movement that would attempt to return the innocent stories of earlier generations. Find out more when we come back. The dark and gritty worlds that emerged in superhero comics following the 80s startled not only some of the fans, but also the industry itself. In the 90s, artist Alex Ross and writer Mark Wade's story, Kingdom Come, was a response to that darkness. Kingdom Come was to some degree a rebuttal to the cynicism, not so much of Dark Knight and Watchmen, but of the world that had come after that, of this whole era of people, writers and artists, thinking that the answer to creation and creativity was to make bigger guys with bigger guns and make them heroes without really asking important questions, fundamental questions about what makes a hero and what is it that we should be looking up to. I had been watching the world of comics over the past 20 years or so get darker and grimmer and grittier and more violent. And I've been, as a reader and as a professional, I've been watching new heroes pop up, heroes, quote unquote, that were just guys with guns, and they didn't fit any sort of profile of hero that I would, would, you know, would feel comfortable with. We basically set up the paradigm where the DC Universe paralleled that reality. When Kingdom Come was a story where it was about 20 years in the future, and the entire world had been taken over by heroes of that caliber, and all bluster and all anger and all rage and no compassion, and the world was just a giant battle zone, and Superman had retired. The hard part about that story was trying to figure out what would take Superman off the playing field. The only thing you could do with Superman was to have the people of Metropolis say to him, we don't want you anymore. We approve of these new killers, these new, this new breed of vigilante who uh, takes the law into their own hand. We don't want you anymore. And so Superman took that message loud and clear and he retired to his Arctic fortress. And what he didn't get is that the moment Superman retired, like Batman and Wonder Woman and Robin and Green Lantern, all those guys get up the next morning and go, why do we even get out of bed? <laughs> why, why bother? Superman gave up. Why should we keep fighting the good fight? So Kingdom Come was a story about the DC Universe after 10 years or so of these characters being, the, the classic heroes being retired and Superman being forced to come back and look at what his retirement had wrought and take responsibility and try to somehow rekindle that notion of selfless heroism in a world that didn't believe in it anymore. It was pretty simply just a, a call out to comics of saying, look, you know, it's, perhaps we're going a little too far with the violence. Perhaps we're going a little too far with, you know, too far astray from what a superhero is. It was, you know, it was a, in that sense, it was a pretty insular story. It wasn't really meant to be a, a broader statement on society. It was really just, a statement on, geez, you know, superhero comics seem to have lost their way. Perhaps we should think about reconsidering what the values of heroes are. Kingdom Come artist Alex Ross has been known to use celebrities, friends, and fellow comic artists as models for his work. The every man we follow through the story is modeled on someone very special to Alex, his father. Kingdom Come was a massive success, paving the way for Darwin Cook's new frontier. He took superheroes out of the shadows and created a work that didn't need to be violent to be sophisticated and successful. I know that New Frontier was an earnest experiment in whether we are capable of telling a hopeful, basically all ages story that still does contain the relevance of a book like Watchmen. And I would never try to compare New Frontier to Watchmen. I don't think it's, they're apples and oranges. If anything, New Frontier is a response to Watchmen. And it's my effort to sort of try to go, look, look, we, you can do both. And as I researched this Justice League project, what 
became clear to me was the beginning for these characters occurred in the mid-50s, and it's a period of history I've always been personally fascinated with. There was McCarthy, there was Wortham, and uh, what, what he did to the comic book industry even. And what America was going through at that time made it you know, a very interesting era to see these modern heroes emerge out of. And from that point on, in the broad strokes, the story more or less wrote itself. Uh, I wish I could say it, it literally wrote itself, but uh, that's, that's sort of where it came from. With Superman, a big part of his portrayal early in New Frontier is a direct response to Miller's portrayal of him. And I can remember a lot of early comments being, oh yeah, he's just ripping off Miller. It's the same idea. Superman's a government tool. He's a mindless idiot. I had always planned, though, that he turns. And we're actually taking what Miller sort of put out there and said, there's no way this guy would stop there. This is maybe, he's naive enough to buy in up until the point he sees behind the curtain. And then, as I like to put it, Superman realizes that being an American has nothing to do with an administration. It has to do with an ideal. And he sets himself apart and above any administrative concerns at that point. I hate to say this to all the fanboys out there, and I guess I'm kind of one of them, but let's face it, boys. These are for kids. They're superhero books. They're for children. These books were created to entertain young people, and I believe to uh, inspire or inform a, a very rudimentary framework regarding what's right or wrong, fair play, good and bad. And I think that, that the books actually served an important purpose when, when that was their focus. It taught young people how to read, it ignited their imaginations, and it also showed them that, that doing the right thing had an upside to it. Its imagery is as iconic as comics ever get. The first cover of John Byrne's relaunch of Superman in the 80s, entitled Man of Steel, shows the close image of Clark Kent's shirt being torn open to reveal Superman's S beneath. By the end of the 80s, comic books had reached an equilibrium. But with the mass market realization that adults read comics too, the door opened for virtually any kind of story. But like they say, the classics never go out of style. From simple comic stories for kids to the more complex adult issues, these are books that put comics in a different light. This is Comics 101. Mike McNola's BPRD is a new take on the superhero group. Coming out of the mythology of Hellboy, the Bureau for Paranormal Research and Defense is a look at state-sponsored heroes fighting larger than life and larger than afterlife evil. Powers by Brian Michael Bendis is an analysis of superheroes from the point of view of the cop who investigates their deaths. The storyline looks at superhero mythology from a human angle. Kurt Busiak's Astro City is one of the ultimate homages to comic books and comic book heroes. Though the characters and environment are Kurt's creations, the city and its superhero population feel new, yet very familiar. His power is virtually limitless. He has a code against killing and always upholds the law. He's captured the imagination of young and old for nearly a century. Even during the darkest period of comic book history, he has maintained his integrity and moral code. When you think superhero, he's the one that comes to mind. It's really hard in a cynical age like today to have a superhero like Superman. Everyone prefers Batman because Batman's driven by vengeance and gothic kind of uh, drives, feelings that kind of fit in with the world we live in, which is a bit more frightening, a bit scarier world. So a hero like Batman is actually cooler in that. But to me, I saw Superman as a guy who really had something to tell us because he is the superhero who just doesn't let us down ever. You know, Superman solves every problem and he solves it with intelligence as well as his fists.
those are last resorts for him, and he still doesn't, he never kills anyone. Grant Morrison's take on Superman was essentially, Superman is the best character, so this should be the best comic. All-Star Superman, which is the Superman comic that he does with the artist Frank Quitely, is just nonstop, fist in the air, making the rock symbol fun. With All-Star Superman, I feel that it's, story-wise, it's so close to what I consider to be the real spirit of Superman. You know, he's the, he's the ultimate kind of father figure. You know, he's, he's kind of the, he's kind of a savior figure in a religious sense as well, but he's, but most of all, he's just an incredibly good guy. There's a lot of thought, there's a lot of detail, there's a lot of clever conceptual stuff behind it but the idea is to do something that just absolutely gives pleasure panel for panel, page for page, all the way through. In regard to tackling Superman from the point of view of other people's expectations of the character, generally speaking, they, it seems people are, are, are fairly on board with us, with what we're doing with it, other, other than my deadlines, of course. The way I look at it is not necessarily comics should come back to an innocent time because I think once, you know, it's like saying should an adult go back to an innocent time? No, it can't happen. But what you can do is at least take some of those ideals that were strong ideals and not give up on them because I think they were powerful. The things that moved us as children, you know, when you're a child, you're very smart. You may not have money and you may not have a lot of influence, but you're pretty smart, you know. You've got an idea of what you like and what's good and what's bad and what's right and what's wrong. And there's a kind of purity and power to that. And to me, there's, there's something in that that just no one's going near because it's almost it's so against the grain of everything that's happening that it's really, for me, it's the interesting strand of Superman to actually say, OK, here is a guy who is this good, deal with it. Oh, and he's not going to, he won't break down over, he's not going to kill everybody, he's not going to lose his morals. And what does that mean? What if we actually have this guy? What would it be like if that guy was in the world as a role model? It would be really irritating, but at the same time, it'd give us all something to aspire to. To say comics are for kids is like saying books are for adults. The idea of using an entire medium to tell stories to only one age group is ludicrous. The work done in comic books has been groundbreaking for readers of all ages. Just because there are pictures in the book doesn't mean it's a picture book.